Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the George Zimmerman case. Zimmerman was charged with murdering Trayvon Martin in 2012 and was acquitted in 2013. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So here I'll provide some background on the players and the context of the situation, move to the actual incident, and then provide the analysis. So starting with the background information, the shooter in this case was 28-year-old George Zimmerman. He is Hispanic. He was 5 foot 8 and weighed between 185 and 200 pounds. We see various reports on his weight. He worked as an insurance fraud investigator and was in college working toward an associate's degree in criminal justice. There are a number of reports about his career aspirations. At one point, he wanted to be a police officer, but around the time of the shooting, his goal was to become a lawyer or a judge. Both Zimmerman and his wife lived in the retreat at Twin Lakes in Sanford, Florida. This was a gated community. Zimmerman had a Florida concealed carry permit since 2009, so legally he could carry and conceal a firearm. The individual that Zimmerman shot was 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. He was a high school junior. He was African-American. He was taller than Zimmerman, but not as heavy, 5 foot 11 and 158 pounds. He lived in Miami Gardens, Florida, but on the day of the shooting, he was with his father and his father's fiance and her son in the retreat at Twin Lakes. This neighborhood had some difficulties in terms of the level of crime. In a 13-month period, starting in January 2011, the police had been called there 402 times. There were a number of burglaries, attempted burglaries, thefts, and even a shooting. Due to the situation, the residents decided to create a neighborhood watch program, and Zimmerman was either chosen to be the coordinator or volunteered as the coordinator. It's really not clear what happened there. Zimmerman was a very active resident in terms of calling the police. Between 2004 and 2012, he called the police about 50 times and made a number of complaints, such as open garage doors, children playing in the street, potholes, and loud parties. Now, the loud parties, I understand, and I guess even the open garage door, although it seems like it would make more sense just to knock on the person's front door and let them know the garage door was open. As far as children playing in the street, if he felt it was because they were in danger, like they could be hit by a car, then that makes sense. But the potholes, I just don't get. Were they armed potholes? Were the potholes recently released from prison? Furthermore, what were the police supposed to do if they answered that call? Would they stand next to Zimmerman and say, you're right, it's a pothole? Like, there's really nothing that can be done there. Are they supposed to take the pothole into custody? This really doesn't make sense. Either way, back to the narrative. With all the break-ins that had occurred recently, we see that Zimmerman started to focus more on suspicious individuals. During this time period, all the people that he reported were black males, but he never offered information about the race to the police unless they asked him. Now moving to February 26, 2012. George Zimmerman is driving in his neighborhood. He spots Trayvon Martin. He calls the police not emergency number at about 7.09 p.m. During this call, Zimmerman expresses concern about a real suspicious guy. He was referring to Trayvon Martin, but of course he didn't know his name at that time. He said the guy looked like he was up to no good and on drugs or something. He said it was raining and he was just walking around looking about. The dispatcher asks if the guy is white, black, or Hispanic. Zimmerman said he looks black. The dispatcher realizes that Zimmerman may be following Martin and asks Zimmerman if that is what he's doing. Zimmerman replies yes, and the dispatcher said, we don't need you to do that. Zimmerman responded, okay. The dispatcher could have been a little more direct, but it was pretty clear what he was saying in that call. It's important to remember, though, that this did not constitute some type of official police order. So Zimmerman was not breaking the law, technically, by following Martin. Not long after this call ended, some type of altercation occurred between Zimmerman and Martin. Zimmerman fired one shot from his pistol. It was a Caltech PF. This is a small, double-action, hammer-fired semi-automatic pistol. It has a seven-round magazine. It's a popular choice for concealed carry. 
The police arrived at 7.17 p.m., just after Zimmerman fired his weapon. The police handcuffed Zimmerman and took his firearm. The police officer noticed that Zimmerman was bleeding from his nose, had an injury on the back of his head, and his back was wet and covered with grass. The police officer observed that Trayvon Martin was face down in the grass and unresponsive. The police and the paramedics administered CPR, but Martin would be declared dead at 7.30 p.m. Zimmerman was treated on the scene for his injuries. When he was in the back of the police car, he told an officer that he had yelled for help during the incident, but no one came to his aid. He was transported to the Sanford Police Department. There he was questioned for five hours. The police used an old trick on Zimmerman and told him that a surveillance camera had captured the whole incident. Zimmerman expressed relief upon hearing this. Zimmerman was released, and the next day he reenacted the incident as the police video recorded him. In April 2012, Zimmerman was charged with second-degree murder. Here's Zimmerman's account of what happened that night. He said that he was driving to the store when he saw Martin walking through the neighborhood. He thought Martin was suspicious because he wasn't trying to get out of the rain, and he was dodging in between houses. Zimmerman also felt something was off about Martin. He was concerned about the recent break-ins that had occurred, so he called the police non-emergency number. He claimed Martin approached his vehicle, and he rolled up his window to avoid a confrontation. Zimmerman said that Martin ran away at this point, and Zimmerman got out of his vehicle so he could figure out where Martin had gone. So he just wanted to know where he went so he could tell the police how to find Martin. The call with the police ended. Zimmerman was walking back to his vehicle when Martin approached him, saying something like, Do you have a problem with me? Zimmerman answered no, and then Martin replied, You have a problem now. Martin punched Zimmerman in the face, which knocked him to the ground. Then Martin started beating Zimmerman's head against the sidewalk. Zimmerman cried for help, and at one point Martin covered his mouth. Martin saw the gun as Zimmerman pulled it out, and he said something like, You're going to die now, or you're going to die tonight. The two fought over the pistol, and ultimately Zimmerman was able to get it away from him and shoot him one time. Zimmerman gave an interview on television in July of 2012. His attorney said it was to raise money for his legal defense. Even though I can appreciate the financial concern, allowing him to give an interview seems like a bad move, although it might not have been the attorney's decision. There's nothing about an interview like that that could help a defendant. During the interview, Zimmerman said that he was sorry that this incident happened, but he did not regret his actions. He said that it was all God's plan. There were eight calls to the police the night of the incident, but only one eyewitness who saw the end of the confrontation. That witness said Martin was on top of Zimmerman, punching him, and Zimmerman was yelling for help. The witness told Martin to stop, and he told him he was calling 911. When he looked again after ascending some stairs, he saw Martin face down in the grass. Other witnesses claimed that they saw two men on the ground scuffling, but they did not see the beginning or the end of the confrontation. One of those witnesses said that a black male wearing a dark colored hoodie was on top of a white or Hispanic male. There was another individual who claimed that she was on the phone with Martin as the incident was unfolding. She said Zimmerman was the aggressor. Later, she admitted to lying about being in the hospital on the day of Martin's funeral. She was largely discredited as a witness. She really ended up helping the defense in the trial, even if that was not her intent. In late 2019, Zimmerman alleged that that witness was actually an imposter. So I don't know if that's the case or not, but that was the allegation. In those 911 calls I mentioned before, in the background, you can hear someone yelling for help. There's been a tremendous amount of debate about who that was. There's no way to know for sure. So in the trial, there was really a lot of uncertainty around that. Zimmerman went to trial for second-degree murder in June of 2013. The central argument of the prosecution was that Zimmerman had profiled Martin and took the law into his own hands. They said Zimmerman was a wannabe police officer and a liar. The defense argued that the evidence supported Zimmerman's account. There were many unknowns in the case, but those unknowns can't be filled with random information. A jury has to decide based on the evidence that's available, not fill in the unknowns with speculation from the prosecution. On July 13, 2013, after deliberating for 16 hours, the jury found Zimmerman not guilty 
of second-degree murder and not guilty of the lesser-included charge of manslaughter. There has been no information released about the mental health factors for anybody in this case, except it appears as though Zimmerman took medication that is often used to treat ADHD. This case is tragic because somebody lost their life. The case also became part of the discussion about racism. Many people believe that Zimmerman profiled Martin, and that is what led to Martin's death. Another problem in this case is there really isn't a lot in terms of evidence. We know that Zimmerman was following Martin, but it's not clear if he continued to follow him after the dispatcher said, we don't need you to do that. Zimmerman was the one who called the police, so if he was planning on killing somebody that night, that would be a really bad idea. There was a physical altercation that occurred, somebody was yelling for help, and Trayvon Martin was shot to death. I think what happens in this case is that because there's so much that is unknown, so much just based on Zimmerman's account, people tend to fill in the blank areas with their own theories. Some people see Zimmerman as an overzealous wannabe cop that chased Martin down and killed him, and other people view this as a classic case of self-defense. Martin attacked, and Zimmerman did what he needed to do to protect himself. So did the jury get the correct verdict in this case? Well, from a legal standpoint, I have to agree with the jury. He was not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The physical evidence, as limited as it was, and the witness accounts corroborated Zimmerman's story. His story fits with the facts in the case. If the struggle turned out differently and Zimmerman had been the one shot and killed, I think that Martin would have been not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt as well. It's the same problem. The person who doesn't survive doesn't get to testify. So we're left with just one side of the story. The law isn't everything, though. As far as moral and intelligent decision-making, Zimmerman failed. There was no need for Zimmerman to call the police. Martin was just walking in the rain. There was no need for him to follow Martin. I think the Zimmerman case touches on the debate about provocation and self-defense. Can somebody ever lose the right to defend themselves from an aggressor? The answer is yes. For example, if an armed burglar breaks into a house that is empty and the homeowner comes back and confronts that burglar with a weapon, that burglar can open fire, but if they killed the homeowner, that would be murder. If they don't open fire and the homeowner kills them, well, then they're dead. So things don't work out well for the burglar either way in this situation. In the Zimmerman case, was Zimmerman's provocation of Martin so extensive that if Martin was in fact the aggressor, Zimmerman did not have the right to defend himself. Should Zimmerman have allowed Martin to beat him potentially to death because Zimmerman may have provoked that confrontation? If a police officer had walked up on this confrontation and shot Martin, would Zimmerman be responsible for Martin's death? Did Zimmerman's decision to follow Martin mean that Martin could do whatever he wanted to Zimmerman? I think another problem with this case is that there are no definitive answers about how one is supposed to behave once one has already potentially provoked another person. If Zimmerman was retreating and he was attacked, what was he supposed to do? What was he allowed to do? I think the reality of this case is that both Zimmerman and Martin acted in a way that was irresponsible and detached from common sense. Zimmerman provoked Martin, and Martin overreacted. One thing I've talked about before in other videos is how I believe that if someone is carrying a gun, they have an increased duty to apply common sense and to avoid confrontations. Carrying a gun is for self-defense, not for going out and engaging other people actively. It's not offensive. Not everybody has the temperament for that responsibility. Those are my thoughts on the George Zimmerman case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis to be interesting. Thanks for watching.